your brain has got a um, your brain's got a purpose and that purpose is to keep you alive that because if you're if you're not staying alive, then your brain isn't staying alive either. So basically, if we cut it down to brass tacks, that's what it wants to do. If somebody might even actually be one dream, because now we are entering into the realm of um, uh, purpose-driven leadership or leadership as it were, or leaders who are uh, going to be using neuroscience uh, to lead or to become better leader. Mm. Mm. Uh, now we're talking also about how the brain works, therefore how the human being works. Uh, mm. How does the brain really work? Generally speaking, nobody needs more neuroscience, you know, <laughs> and in a leadership role, what we want is ways to be more effective. Understanding the brain from what neuroscience tells us and then being able to apply it, that is a powerful mix. That is very, very potent in terms of a leadership toolkit. checking out Obehi podcast. We encourage people to own their story and share it with the world to expand their purpose. Before we start this presentation, I have something to quickly share with you. Are you a purpose-driven entrepreneur? I mean, do you want to cut across the noise and attract your ideal client by leveraging your own story? Then pay attention. I have a signature program that can help you own your story. A five-step transformative journey to reshape your professional and business narrative for success in less than 90 days. And it's available at academy.aclasses.org slash story. This is what we have understood. Storytelling is the most powerful instrument known to man. And this is what that could mean to you. You can either own your story and use it to advance your purpose in your business and professional life, or someone else will do. The choice is yours. Now let's get started with today's episode of the Obehi podcast. I have a, a serious book habit and I'm always reading multiple books at any given time. Um, none of them, interestingly, are fiction. Uh, so I have, I think what some people would consider a very boring and dry book list, but for me, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I live in Northern Ireland. I, I do martial arts. I do kendo, which is a Japanese sword art. I also enjoy road cycling. I've got two almost grown up kids who are very independent and know exactly what they want to do with themselves. So that's great. And other than that, I am involved in all kinds of things with people who are trying to make change. And that seems to be a recurring theme in the people that I work with. I love that change. That's sort mm. of uh, fitting into the conversation of the, of the day, because now we are going to be talking about how to use uh, neuroscience in leadership. No? Uh, but mm -hmm. the way I'm looking at leadership is now is um, a purpose-driven leadership, so that a type of leadership that is governed by a kind of a deeper meaning behind what you do. And I think that mm -hmm. is going to be very important now because talking of meaning, talking of purpose, uh, that is going to be very interesting for me. But the first question would be, how did you get into neuroscience? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, thanks for asking that one because I've always leaned into trying to understand how people think, why they think the way they think, um, what influences that. And of course, you know, when I went to university sort of 30 something years ago, there weren't all that many options available to do the sort of work that I'm doing now. Um, and then I was doing various other things and communications and so on. And uh, when my kids came along, my son actually inspired me to dig deeper into this whole neuroplasticity thing because he and his sister did not learn the same way. It was very clear to me that um, he was going to be quite different from her when it came to education and so on. 
So for me, the opening, the, the way the door opened to uh, working with applied neuroscience was trying to understand the learning process. And of course, the learning process, the word that we use for that in neuroscience is neuroplasticity. So that's a that's a very quick roundabout or little story about how we got here. All right, that's interesting. How has it how has it been for you the journey? Uh, fascinating, utterly fasc fascinating. And I think one of the things that um, I would say about this journey with applied neuroscience is that it really helps you to become very, um, very comfortable with uncertainty. And I think that this is one of the things that, you know, in our world, there is so much that is uncertain. We put such a huge amount of energy into trying to create certainty in various ways that this notion that anything that we are working with now is really based on the frontiers that we've got to and that they may change at any given time because we might make a new discovery. We might have something else tomorrow that is a better explanation for the way the brain is working. So, be, you know, coming to terms with uh, uncertainty has definitely been part of that and, and just, as I said, getting more and more comfortable with it. But that in general terms, makes the world a much easier place to navigate as well. I want to believe that there is somebody who did not understand what the civil mean by neuroscience. Uh, let's pretend mm -hmm. that is the case. So how do you okay. describe neuroscience? So how I describe neuroscience is really what scientists are doing to understand how the brain works and how that impacts everything that is going on in our lives. Now, that sometimes um, can be very biological. So it can be about the way the different cells in the brain work, or it can be much more about how we are thinking about things and how we're responding to things. And then when we talk about applied neuroscience, which is the part of it that I'm involved in, that's when we look at all of the results of this research and these discoveries that are being done by scientists working with, um, with the brain and the human experience. And we take those findings and we make them useful for everyday life, for the real world challenges that we face. Somebody might even actually be wondering, because now we are entering into the realm of um, uh, purpose-driven leadership or leadership as it were, or leaders who are uh, going to be using neuroscience uh, to lead or to become better leader. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're talking also about how the brain works, therefore how the human being works. Uh, mm -hmm. But how does the brain really work? Because now we have the opportunity of having a, a scientist here with us uh, who uh, understand the brain. I was reading somewhere, uh, somebody was saying that the brain is an entire universe of its own, that there is a mm -hmm. lot that we still need to understand about it. Because now with AI and all of the conversation is on the table. So how much do we know of ourselves? How much do we know of the environment we live in? How much do we know of this little ball that we have, we have up here? So, yeah, how does the brain really work? Oh, they, these are great questions. And I mean, you can see that even at this very sort of starting level, at, at, just as we're getting out of the blocks on this one, it's already profoundly philosophical as well as technical. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we, we could go down that rabbit hole very, very quickly. Um, but le let's, let's, just, let's just make it very empirical. Your brain has got a um, your brain's got a purpose, and that purpose is to keep you alive. That because if you're if you're not staying alive, then your brain isn't staying alive either. So basically, if we cut it down to brass tacks, that's what it wants to do. Now, because each and every one of us is a confluence of all the different circumstances of our lives to this point. So your upbringing, your culture, your diet, your environment, all of those things make you a unique um, sample, a unique specimen of how this piece of equipment in our in our heads is actually going to approach something. So that's why we've got these kind of similar biological things, but we, because we've all had such unique experiences, our brain will then take different uh, approaches to fulfilling that mission of keeping us safe. Thank you for that. Now, uh, of course, I have the opportunity to talk to you now as a neuroscientist. Uh, then I'm going to ask you a curiosity that I was having a couple of years ago. What I was thinking at the time was that there is very, very little that we know of the subconscious. 
then I was saying that the subconscious is like a super hybrid database that we need to tap into for us to be able to mm. understand uh, where we find ourselves. Of course, I'm ask, I'm saying this because I want you to sort of help us understand that part and how that might be related to mm. what we are talking about today as uh, within the, the realm of neuroscience. Then I was giving an example saying, uh, look at Anetello that is uh, going to drink water. Uh, only that this Antelo just realized that uh, between somewhere in the triangle of an event, there is a lion that is also coming to, to feed because the lion is going to die if it doesn't have food. Only that the food of the lion is the antelope. The antelope need to drink water. The antelope need to drink water. If it doesn't drink water, it's going to die. I say, let's freeze the time and let's examine this. The antelope is going to make a very fast decision. It's mm -hmm. going to ask itself, uh, am I going to take this water or am I going to run away? Uh, mm. But how is Etelo going to make that decision based on what? Okay, how far is a lion from me, where I am now? If I were to go to take water, will I be able to drink water and then run away before the lion catches up with me? Or mm. will I just run away? But why would the antelope know that he need to run away? I, I was saying that when the antelope is making this decision that is very fast, uh, uh, and they are very accurate almost all the time. Because if we make a slight mistake, it's going to die that very instant. Therefore, mm -hmm. it needs to be very accurate uh, in mm -hmm. making that decision. But I was saying, the antelope is not really basing all the experience on its life. It's basing it on the life of the ancestor that I've been living before. Based on the experiences that have happened before, uh, the antelope and the lion and the environment. Because... They know what has been happening before. I was saying, therefore, that if we are able to tap into our subconscious and therefore the super hybrid database, which is beyond just our life, then we might be able to go far in life depending on what we want. Mm. So that was just my rumination at the time. Let mm. us understand. Uh, maybe uh, what's very, the very nice. of it? <laughs> very nice thought experiment. Um, and... I think one of the things that, you know, we do have to uh, be cognizant of as well is that in its mission to keep you safe, the brain does use certain calculations that are so fast that we're not aware of them. So, for instance, um, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett and some other people actually as well talk about this idea of the brain predicting things. And it's it's using what it knows, like you've talked about, all of the things that it has gathered up from its environment, things that have been passed down through the generations, whether in terms of advice or um, our genetic makeup and so on. And we are just processing that information so incredibly quickly that we don't know we can't we can't keep up with it in our sort of conversational mind in the mind that is talking to us. But this word that's coming up here, this is really, really fascinating. We talk about our mind a lot. We talk about making up our mind. We talk about changing our mind. We talk about mindset. And if I were to ask you now, what is your mind? What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> Where is my mind? Well, of course, usually I would just uh, point to my head that maybe my mind is there <laughs> or the NG that is sort of uh, conducting my day-to-day -day affair, but I don't even know if that is uh, correct. <laughs> but this, yeah. this is it, isn't it? I mean, this is uh, one of the things. We talk about this so much. We're so aware that it exists, but we rarely stop to consider what it might be. So there is um, there's a little phrase or a little quote from Dr. Dan Siegel that I really like, and we are still at a stage where we're discovering more, where we're trying to... Um, understand more. But he, along with colleagues in various disciplines, brought this, well, it's a kind of a definition um, together. So they call the mind an emergent, self-organizing, embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Now, that is going on for and inside each of us, well, inside and outside because it's relational. And that is that encapsulates the idea of mind very well. So what do you think of that? That is fascinating. Mm. <laughs> it is fascinating that it's also very complex, uh, trying to look at the mind, uh, how it functions. 
But of course, I'm mm. not an expert on, um, on how the mind works. That is why we have you at the neuroscience to help us understand the code that. Of course, mm. you see the example that I was given. That is just based on my understanding as an amateur. I try to uh, paint a picture for people uh, to uh, sort of look at how powerful the subconscious can be. Mm. Uh, yeah. But of course, again, I remember also in that book, I was saying, note that your subconscious is an autopilot. And as an autopilot, I think I like what you said in the beginning. Note that the only function of your subconscious is to keep you alive, nothing more than that. If you want to run it, if you want to do something different from that, you are going to be the one to dictate it. And everything you need is inside of it. So the mm. subconscious is not going to ask you want to become the president. That have to, it, it doesn't care about that. It, what it cares about is that you are alive. If, if we, right, two things. If we break down this um, definition, Dr. Dan Siegel's definition, we can see a lot of the aspects of what go to make up these decision-making patterns and so on that we have. Um, and then the next thing that we have to be able to consider is the idea of neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is basically the fancy science word for how our brains learn and change and adapt throughout our lives. And it's it's something that can happen anytime. And we used to think um, that basically when you got to be an adult, then it was almost a case of you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But we know different now and we know that people are able to learn and change and adapt. And it's just as well considering how fast the world changes these days. And this is one of the challenges for, for leaders is that things are changing so rapidly, um, you know, even since 2020, look at how much has changed in the world. All right, let's take it to the conversation of, that we are sort of uh, having in mind today, which is um, uh, the purpose-driven um, leadership or leader. Uh, what would be the role of neuroscience in the life of such an individual who has a deep purpose, I want to be able to carry it out as a leader. So the benefits of being aware of how your brain is working for a leader um, creates an entirely new range of choices. Because when we are driven by habits and by thinking that we haven't really given much of an assessment to, then we are likely to just run on, I think you used the word autopilot there, um, that we're, we're running on assumptions, we're running on maybe expectations that come from other places, we're running on ideas that we haven't actually analysed and assessed. We are also running on predictions. We mentioned the idea of predictions a little while ago, that our brain, because it wants to save energy in case it ever ends up like that antelope needing to run, it wants to make sure that it has got enough energy to carry us through and help us survive. So a lot of the time, our brain is it's actually very, very energy hungry. Um, the, the brain uses, a, in the amount of energy that you will use today, your brain will use about 20% of that. So that's a lot considering how small your brain actually is in relation to the rest of you. And in fact, I worked this out one time. If you're, if you, if the rest of your body was working at the same kind of, um, the same energetic consumption rate as, as your brain was, then you would probably weigh something like 15 kilos. So um, that just gives you an idea how much energy the brain consumes. 15 kilos is like a quarter of me. I would be a quarter of my, my actual size. So <laughs> we, we would look, we would be very, very different creatures if, um, if that was the case. Um, so understanding the understanding neuroplasticity, understanding um, what it is that we are, we have learned about the world and about how we engage with things, about what is safe to do, what is not safe to do, what rewards us, what we are um, scolded for, or what, what, you know, what has bad outcomes for us. All of these things are things that we have learned along the way and that we now use to form our predictions, our um, expectations, and our assumptions about how things will be in the future. Unfortunately, that, that can actually be quite a flawed strategy too, because just because something has happened one way before does not mean that it will necessarily happen the same way again. And um, this, is, uh, this is definitely something that is important for leaders to consider as well, if they are trying to forecast something, if they're trying to make 
uh, a prediction about how things will go. The fact is that it, we're, we're working in a very, very complex system and it doesn't always turn out the way we think it might, even with you know a long track record of it going that way. And if we if we bring this back to working with people rather than, for instance, uh, economic predictions or anything like that. So say, for instance, you and I have known each other for 10 years or 20 years of age. And every time I've met you, it has been fantastic. It's been a great conversation and we're always having a lot of fun. We're having a lot of, we're generating ideas and insights together. So every time, you know, the next time I go to have a meeting with you, I will be quite excited about it and I'll think, oh, this is going to be great. I'm looking forward to this. Whereas if, for instance, we had known each other for the same length of time, but every time you and I had met, we got into an argument or we couldn't agree on anything or, you know, it was always a stalemate or you know, one of us felt that the other was always trying to put each other down. Then for the next meeting, I would probably be saying, oh, God, no, I've got to talk to him again today. So. It would be, you know, I, I, I think you see where I'm going with this. We form opinions of people and then we show up in a way that almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if we are preparing for a fight, we're more likely to see one if there isn't one there. At the prediction. Um, okay, I, I get the point that uh, the prediction sometimes is based, is based on the experience that we have had before. And you also said something to the effect that, um, but it's not always true all the time that what has happened before is going to repeat itself. Mm. Now, we are putting all these elements in the hands of a leader. Mm. What are all this going to mean? Because it's not necessarily down saying that you need to always trust on what is mine or the brain is telling you based on what has happened before. Because mm -hmm. there is no guarantee that what has happened before is going to repeat itself exactly. So exactly. what should, what sense should a leader or a purpose-driven leader make of this? Mm, great question. So if we have got a situation where we are self-aware enough to recognize that we have certain predictions that we're making. We feel a certain way about something because it has happened that way before. Then that is the point where we can start to stop and ask ourselves, is that really true? What makes that true? Is there something that I can choose to do differently? Is there a different state of mind that I could go to this with? If I am apprehensive, for instance, can I be more curious? Can I be braver? Can I look to be more engaged with what I'm doing? So this is really all about um, starting to take stock of our own thinking and taking the pauses that are necessary to actually reflect on how we have been and whether or not that's the most effective way for us to approach the situation at hand. Oh, that is very interesting. That is very interesting. Of course, uh, as a leader, is uh, putting them at the at the driver's seat. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, you are talking to a leader. You are telling this individual to leverage the power of neuroscience uh, in their leadership. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tools you would tell them to leverage more to get results? Mm -hmm. Because as a leader, you want to get results because you are leading a people, or sometimes you are leading yourself to a place. And mm. you need to, or you need strategy for you to be able to get there. Otherwise, you would already be there, no? <laughs> so there are a number of things that leaders particularly need to consider. Um, number one is the fact that they are in a situation where they have got to manage themselves. Um, a leader cannot run out of resources in terms of either their mental capacity or in terms of their physical capacity or in terms of the relationships that they've got around them. Any of these things will seriously damage the effectiveness of that leader. So there is a discipline that goes with making sure that you are looking after yourself. And this sounds so basic. And how is this even neuroscience? But if you think about it in terms of self-care is brain care, then it starts to take on a different appearance. And this, this was actually something I would, prior to becoming involved with applied neuroscience, I, um, 
I didn't really think that self-care was something that I needed to worry about. Um, it was something that I would do if I had time, but realistically, everything else that needed to be done should come first. I take a very, very different view of that now because I know the impact that it has on my brain and my ability to be effective if I'm not looking after myself, if I'm not getting exercise, if I'm not eating well, if I'm not sleeping well or drinking enough water. If, you know, if I am running out of energy, then I am going to make bad decisions. I am not going to show up in a way that helps the people that I'm trying to lead. Um, it means that my life satisfaction is going to be a lot worse. So that is the key thing. First step, if you are not looking after yourself as a leader, then you are not going to be as effective as you could be. That is very valuable, uh, particularly today where we uh, we are overhauling some time. Maybe mm. I should say almost all the time, no? So we need to take care of ourselves. Mm. I, I used to say quite often because, you know, that is the idea of... Um, that we need to serve. Of course, we need to serve. No? That is why we are here. We need to serve people. But I think it's also good that we need to serve ourselves. Because if you don't serve yourself, okay, let, let's say love. Maybe that is the best way to put it. We love everybody, right? But if you don't love yourself and you say you are loving people, you're, you're probably lying because you don't even know what love means. To really demonstrate that you know what love means, you first of all need to love yourself. So that when you tell somebody, I love you, or I love you, you know what mm -hmm. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you sacrifice something you don't know? So I think that is, that mm -hmm. is important. It's important also in the day that we are living in, where we are basically making out people uh, for the name of, in the name of the organization. We need to also mm -hmm. teach people how to love themselves. Uh, I think that is important. Very, very. 100%. I completely agree with you. And there's an exercise that I sometimes do with people and I ask them to um, write down a list of all the people in their lives that they love. And the number of times that people do not include themselves is it far outweighs the number of times that they will. Very few people will actually put themselves on that list. And I think that's quite telling, don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> mm. All right. Purpose. But that is that is really central to us uh, in Ecclesis Media. Uh, right now, I'm preparing a signature program, which is entirely about helping people to find their voice, their story. But the people that we are targeting for that are not just everybody. We are looking for a purpose-driven entrepreneur, entrepreneur that have a deep purpose or that are looking for a deeper purpose within what they are doing. Uh, mm. Okay, making money is also a good thing, but we're not just looking for people who just want to make money. As an entrepreneur, mm. you must be providing solution. But before you can provide solution, because it go back to what we are talking about before now, before you can want to help people, you must have a deeper meaning for that. Otherwise, you could just go and steal money from somewhere and give it to somebody. You no, know? mm. I, I, I think it is important that we have a strong reason behind what we are doing. So that is what um, that signature program is about, to help people to find their deeper meaning that should mm. override whatever is it that they are doing. Also because, you know, life is not easy. Anybody that has been alive for a considerable amount of time should understand that living for the very art of living is hard. But if that is the case, you must be living for a purpose. Anyway, having said that, we are talking of uh, purpose-driven leadership. Um, how can neuroscience help them to clarify their purpose? Yes, yes. Um, there are actually quite a lot of exercises that we would do that tap into um, that tap into basically the the way the brain works to help us to understand our values. And being we have um, knowing what it is that we value. And what it is that gives meaning to our lives actually helps us to um, to be more effective. If we are working towards a purpose, then we want to do that. We see the value in doing that. If we are, um, you know, for some people, that is providing for their families, and that is, you know, making money at whatever way they can do that because they want to provide for their families. So, on the other hand. 
what we need to distinguish between is the idea of our values that we think of as being the the very important things for us and what we actually value in our lives. So those two things are not always the same. And the way I tend to explain this to people is if we have that situation, for instance, where um, someone says that their family is their most important value and they will do everything for their family. Um, one person might do that by working very long hours, six or seven so that they are earning a, a lot of money to look after their family. Another person might take a completely different approach and take a very, very basic job that they just go in, they do their work, they come home, and then they spend all of that extra time with their families. So this, this idea between knowing what it is that we value versus what we consider to be our values, that's important. Um, moving on from, from that, what we can start to do then is to look at how the brain works in terms of um, whether it wants to create situations where it is free and uh, it being creative or whether we are leaning towards more structure and security, how we can integrate those things to optimize the, the way that we can be effective. Learning how to switch almost between those two things can really help to uh, up our game, as it were. The more we understand, uh, I guess, in metaphoric terms sometimes, how the brain is working, because the brain is so utterly complex that it would be impossible to to understand all the ins and outs and workings of it. It's I, I, I don't think I will ever get to the bottom of that. I would be entirely surprised if by the end of my life, I fully understand my own brain. But that's not to put anyone off because what we can do with some far less complicated ways of understanding and describing this is that we can start to recognize patterns. We can start to recognize strategies. We can start to support our own neuroplasticity to create the changes that we want to see. Okay. Now, as a, um, a neuroscientist, what do you really concentrate on in understanding how the brain functions? What do you concentrate on in this, um, in this human brain that you, because mm. I don't know if you are really concentrating on every part of it or some part of it. Uh, could you share something uh, around that line? Mm. So for me and for many people who work in this applied neuroscience field, um, a lot of it is really about helping people to understand and support neuroplasticity that we mentioned earlier. Um, knowing what it is that is going on when we are learning something, when we have learned something and when we want to learn something new. So uh, I think we probably talked about this on the last show where we we did the um, the thing about the, the toothbrush experiment. Did did we talk about that yeah, the last yeah, time? Yeah, I, I think we did. Mm -hmm. By the way, maybe you, you might need to re-explain yeah. that uh, for people to understand. Well, um, there, there are some things that seem like they should be really easy to change in terms of how we do something. So for instance, if you are uh, if you're brushing your teeth, you do it with your dominant hand every day, multiple times a day, all through your life. So you know it really, really well. But then if you've got to switch hands for some reason, um, if you've say you've broken your dominant hand and you've got to change to the other side, even though it looks like it should be a really simple switch, then it feels like you've got someone else's hand in your mouth and you are learning very quickly that it's not the same thing because you have in your brain, you have laid down all the connections. You have strengthened all the connections through repetition that go to brushing your teeth with your dominant hand to do it with your non-dominant hand. Those connections are not well worn. They are not um, embedded in your brain. They haven't been repeated enough to build up what's called myelination. And that myelination is a, a process where the it's parts of the the neurons in your brain get wrapped in this little coating that's almost like changing from old old telephone line internet to super fast broadband. So it's like really really funky connection to something very fast and smooth. So when we are 
talking about neuroplasticity, that can cover such a wide range of things. Everything from our physical actions, like the toothbrushing or like um, driving a different kind of car or uh, learning a new sport or hobby. Any of those things will require neuroplasticity because you've got to change certain connections in your brain and you've got to build up some muscle memory and so on as well. Um, but also when we are um, when we are thinking about things, and this is this is very important. When we are thinking, we build up thought patterns as well. So people have people have asked me recently, you know, why do um, why do we remember certain things from when we're very little? Um, why do we build up these ideas and thoughts and patterns from so many years ago that we can hardly remember where we got them? And there are probably many explanations for this, but one way to think about it is that when we are very small and we are absorbing an awful lot of things from the people closest to us, from our families, from whoever is looking after us, then there isn't a lot else. You know, our brains are developing really, really quickly, um, but we don't have the level of distraction that we have as adults. So we're taking things in, we're soaking them up like a sponge and we are paying attention to them. So when we are very distracted and busy in our lives and we're trying to make a change, then um, it, it can seem like it's really, really hard. But as with the toothbrushing thing, so if, if I set the challenge to go and brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand every day this week, you'd probably forget to do it. So you wouldn't be supporting your neuroplasticity because you would, um, you'd be thinking about something else as you were going to brush your teeth. And you would have finished completely all before you even remembered that you were supposed to be trying to learn to do it a new way. And this is what I mean by supporting neuroplasticity as well. Um, so if, for instance, we have uh, a, a repetitive thoughts about how we are not good enough to be doing something, for instance, that if people are not they don't respect us or they don't think that we do a good job. If that's the kind of thing that we repeatedly think, then we build up a pattern of that thinking. And that's something that we can actually uh, break. We can find new ways to think about that and we can learn how to support those new patterns of thinking as well. So a re repetition and focus and the attention that we give to things, that is a, that's a key part of the strategy of being able to become more effective, to adopt more effective strategies. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Um, now, how would a leader, uh, a purpose-driven leader, apply this strategy in their work to become better leaders? This, this is a big question, and it very much depends on what the situation is that the leader is in. So let's take an example rather than trying to apply it across a broad brush. So say we've got a leader who wants to um, who wants to encourage their team to bring them more ideas. He wants to have a more inclusive team where people are bringing them ideas. OK, so the desire is there. The values are there that are related to developing their people, making sure that people are involved and they get to develop their talents and their their place in the team. However, that leader also perhaps has a habit of absolutely jamming their diary packed full of stuff. Um, and that means that they don't actually have time to listen when people bring them ideas. So while they, the leader wants their team to bring them ideas, that leader will also have to think about how do I change the habits that I have built up? How do I um, reassign the rewards that I feel from being very busy to create space to think about having gaps in my diary differently? So that is it. That's that's a, a that, that's a whole change in how someone thinks about themselves, their identity, their relationship with productivity, and how that relates to the people that they work with. Thank you for that. Uh, but I have a kind of a personal question for you. Uh, why do hmm. you uh, pay attention to leadership? Why is leadership important for you? Leadership is important because leaders have. Um, the opportunity to create a 
bigger ripple when they are dealing with this stuff. So when a leader is ready to commit to um, understanding how their own brain works and how that can uh, make them more effective, then it is well it's certainly my hope that they will go on to realize how valuable it is to have everyone in their team having access to this kind of information because a leader on their own with the information is going to they're going to struggle if if everybody else doesn't do it isn't aware isn't uh, doesn't have access to the same kind of tools and thinking that they do but if that leader is able to see that this could be a much bigger thing this this could really wow this could go beyond me this could be the team this could be the entire organization um and just having that little dropping a pebble in and seeing those ripples go out because leaders have that gift that they are able to um share those things they're able to make sure that this is opened up to other people as well all right thank you for that uh, when you were talking just now, you made mention of value. Um, now, because we are looking at a leader uh, who is going to be uh, guiding people or leading them, as it were, um, I don't know if you could say something about how are we able to know our value? How are we able to define them? Because when we do now, those values then come to guide us, uh, determine what we do, uh, how we uh, interact also with other people. But the question is, how do we know what are our key values? I don't know because I don't think everybody actually know how to do that. Mm. Well, um, can I ask you what your values are? Well, my values, the, the values that are very key for me is being able to add to help people with the information that I have. Uh, I remember, for example, uh, when I started to learn online, and most importantly, because uh, I come here to Italy, I didn't have the chance to be able to go to university and all of that. So I started to learn everything I could online. Most of the things I, I was learning, I would like just sharing it with people without ever asking anything from it. And to date, I still really sort of do a bit of that because I get to a point people were asking me, but hey, why it's time that you charge money for it, no? Because it's just natural for me that if I know it, you can know it. If you don't know it, I can share what I learned with you. So, so uh, for example, in Obehi podcast, the reason that I actually do the podcast is that I found a lacuna, uh, which is uh, why are people not able to put their stories out there? How I got the idea is I lost my father when I was in primary two. I would be very happy if I could get a, a video of my father talking, but it doesn't exist anywhere. Because I know how I know how valuable it would be for people to see uh, their grandfather, I'm talking to people that will be in the future, but this actually is conditioning what I'm doing, who will see their father talking somewhere, are sharing a value to people, their experiences, you know? So that in, my, in this podcast, when I start, of course, I didn't do that, that much with you yeah, because of the time we have. I usually start by telling me about yourself. Where are you from? Where did you grow up with? You know, all these experiences, which are just deeply... Uh, typically, your personal experiences. From from there, we move to the second phase, which is what do you do? Why do you love what you do? So I do mm -hmm. this because these are actually my key value. This is my way of making a contribution uh, in the universe. Is that mm -hmm. I, I believe that everything that I know can actually be at the service of people. If what I do mm -hmm. cannot be in line with this, then it's going to be pretty difficult for me to do that. Yeah. Okay, so if I were to ask you then, um, what is it that making a contribution, which is the, the thing that's come through there of, uh, from what you've said, what is it that making, a, how does that make you feel? Absolutely fantastic. It makes me feel good. That is mm. why if I do this, because uh, the what I do is really hard. It's hard mm. in the sense that I need to do a lot of it. There was some time, there was some time I was doing, I was publishing episode every day. That is hard. Mm. But it's not really, I don't look at it as hard because anytime I'm doing it, I'm feeling very happy. So that mm. somebody might say, but how are you able to do that? Because I love to do it. I am not really considering mm. the, the time frame that I'm doing it now. I am imagining who is going to benefit later. And let me give you an instance. Mm. There are some people that I've interviewed 
Maybe after I publish the episode, because usually when I do interview, I will ask you, do you know somebody else that I can also talk to in line with what you are doing? So because of this, I have a network of people who maybe through that I've gotten uh, to know other people that I've interviewed. They, in that network, that somebody will mm -hmm. call me, ah, the person that I told you about at the interview the other day is dead. It have happened not one, not two, not three times. Now, mm -hmm. when I go to review those interviews, I'm saying, ah, but if this person have never be present in this episode, it will still be dead by now. But now that he has been here, mm. his story is dead. Nobody's going to touch it. Now, his children, or if he have a child, he's going, are going to grow up one day, maybe searching on the internet, they will find an episode where their father is talking. Because I repeat again, I will find a lot of value if I could see a picture or a video of my father talking in an mm. episode like this, just talking about himself. But it doesn't exist. So I believe people mm. who mm. Uh, are going to have the chance to be able to see record of their their loved one because of what I'm doing, I'm going to find value in that. I know I'm not doubting that at all. So that is what I, why I'm mm. doing what I'm doing. That is very very interesting, isn't it? Because from we've gone from just helping people, which was what you started with, and as you've talked, what's come out is that you are connecting people with people who may not be here any longer you you know it's it's that being able to uh to see what they were thinking and feeling and talking about and what was important to them so that's 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 really really interesting thank you for sharing that with me actually that was that thank was you. lovely that. <laughs> um yeah. so but i mean we're, we're talking here about values and you know this is the thing isn't it, it this isn't um this isn't necessarily a a fast conversation to have with people because a lot of the time what's loaded on top of our uh, perceived values is a lot of expectations from people. You know, we do things because we feel like uh, our family expects it of us or our boss expects it of us or um, our, our society expects it of us. And we sometimes take on the values of those people around us as our own. We adopt them as our own, even if they're not 100% true to us. And that is something that, um, that, that takes a little bit of digging into and that takes a little bit of time and it can be a bit of a messy process. But when we get down to um, just, you know, laying out a little bit of right this this is what you, your brain remember has been trying to protect you it has done all of these things it has used neuroplasticity to learn ways to navigate this world as it exists as it existed with all the people that you grew up with that you work with now um and it's taking that time to i think become aware to to recognize that you know we have this emergent self-organizing embodied and relational process regulating the flow of energy and information that mind that we have so it's um it's 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 a fun journey getting to there but it's also uh sometimes it can be an uncomfortable journey and this is one of the other things that leaders definitely need to to consider for themselves one of the ways that our brains keep us safe is protecting us from things that don't feel comfortable. And a lot of the time that can be things that are maybe emotional, um, where we have to question our beliefs or our identity or um, choices that we've made and so on. But here's the thing, when we look at this through the, through the neuroscience lens, then we actually get ways to step back from it. We get ways to assess the emotional process in terms of what it really is, um, a brain function that helps us to survive in the world. And we can stop being uh, as judgmental maybe as we typically would be. We can stop rejecting these things. We can just observe them and know that they are there and start to understand them better. And, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that I often talk about in terms of leadership development is that quite often we have people who know that they need to do some work, do some development and so on. And they go out of their way to invest in this, to put the time into it. Um, but a lot of the time what they're doing is they are, it, if you can imagine um, trying to put up shelves. So you're going to organize everything. You're going to put up some shelves for that. You go out and you buy all the materials and the tools and all the rest of it. And then the room that you're putting these shelves up in, you just don't bother turning on the light. 
So when we talk about neuroscience and understanding how the brain works, it's like we're turning on the light, which means that that we can then support putting up these structures that will help us to be more effective um, and have a great set of shelves in, in our in our uh, way of working, if that's not too too much of a metaphoric stretch. That is really important. Uh, that metaphor is really, it is, it is, you can see it, you know, that make it more uh, impactful. So yeah, yeah, that is that is really great. It's a, it's a great picture there. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. <laughs> All right, now tell me, talking of neuroplasticity, uh, how would storytelling be relevant in an area like this? Uh, say, as somebody uh, tapping into the power of story, of course, story now would be knowing what have happened before you, uh, knowing mm. also, okay, the things of leader, and maybe, yes, what have happened before you, but what has all happened before the people that you are leading? Because all the time, mm. nearly all the time, people are always responding to what have happened before. So how will storytelling mm. be relevant in the working of neuroplasticity in our lives, or maybe in the life of a leader, for example? Okay, that, that's a great question as well. And you know, I was thinking about something this morning, actually. Um, have you ever noticed the way when someone goes to a place as a tourist, they go and they see all the historic things and they go and they learn all the stories about what happened there. And quite often the people who live there have never been, they've never visited that place, you know? Very common. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example, actually. I mean, I live in Belfast in Northern Ireland and Belfast was the place where the uh, the big ship, the Titanic was built. And we have a big museum for that. And thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of visitors come every year to see this Titanic Museum. And I have to confess, I haven't actually been yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is one of the things, the story that is, you know, sometimes closest to us, we tend to block that out. We're not that interested in it. We have other things going on. That doesn't mean that it isn't interesting to other people around us. And I think, you know, for leaders to be able to, and, and any entrepreneurs really, to be able to tap into what their own story is, it helps people to relate to them. Um, and also when people are listening to this, they're listening to learn. We tend to listen to stories. It's either to learn or to be entertained. And when we are listening to the journey that a leader has taken to become a leader, then we are learning about how to lead. We're learning how to become leaders ourselves. If we are learning about the um, how someone has developed, if, if they're telling a story of what has gone on in their lives that has helped them to, to change, then we are learning that change is possible for us too. There are so many things that um, you know we learn from hearing other people's stories. And every time that we are open to a story as well as a listener, then we are receptive to something that will resonate and help us to think differently, which activates our own neuroplasticity as well. Is it possible that we can say neuro, uh, neuroscience can help a leader become a better leader? That maybe because you understand the, the workings of neuroscience, uh, there can be a difference between your type of leadership and the person who have no understanding of neuroscience. What do you say about that? Hmm. Um, okay, I think that generally speaking, nobody needs more neuroscience, you know? <laughs> and in a leadership role, what we want is ways to be more effective. Understanding the brain from what neuroscience tells us and then being able to apply it that is a powerful mix. That is very, very potent in terms of a leadership toolkit. Knowing how we are um, responding to things, what our actions, our reactions, and our interactions are like based on how we have behaved so far, how, what we have learned about ourselves, and how we want to be going forward, how we can um, how we can adopt new strategies, and how we can support that adoption of those strategies. That's where understanding how the brain works, understanding what we can apply from neuroscience really comes into its own. That, I appreciate that. Um, if somebody were to look for you online, maybe they want to learn more about what you're doing, uh, recommend to them, how can they find you? What is the best way to reach out to you? Uh, two ways, um, you can find me on LinkedIn, which is easy. You just go uh, LinkedIn and it's forward slash Deirdre Morrison. 
And the other way is my website, which is neurocreative.studio. All right. Now, we've talked about uh, leadership today, how to use the power of neuroscience uh, in leadership to become a better leader, of course. Uh, I know we have touched different area in it. Now, what would be your final thought here to conclude the conversation? Perhaps that is something you, you even wanted to say and you don't want to ask you. Please go ahead and conclude it in your own way. Um, I would say that applied neuroscience and the tools that it can deliver, the toolkit that it can create for leaders and for emerging leaders is very, very important. What I would also say is that it's not just for leaders, it's for everyone that those leaders are working with. And um, we need to think about how we can get more people using this because leadership development in many ways is human development. And we want to develop as many people as we can so that they can be leaders when they need to lead and be supporters when they need to support because it's collaboration, it's communication, it is creativity, it is engagement and innovation. All of these things bloom out of having the awareness of self and having the ability to know how to support our choices, how to support our um, our levels of interaction and our effectiveness. That's where it becomes really, really important um, and and a way of changing the world. Thank you so much for that. That is full of value. The, the message is for everybody, not just for leaders. Uh, uh, it is for everybody. I really appreciate that. This is a really great conversation. Thank you so much, Jodre. I appreciate oh. it. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too. Thank, Thank you. you so much.